All right, let's put on our show. All right, 3.30. Three thirty PM on Friday, Eastern Standard Time. You know what that means. It's time for the stupidest show on Instagram. Drink Grow Rich. Am I on? I don't think I'm on yet. <laughs> What's up with it? Live title. There we go. Three thirty PM Eastern Standard Time on Friday. You know what that means. It is time for the stupidest show on the internet by far. Drink and grow rich. Welcome, everybody. This is the stupid show where I get drunk on Friday at 3.30. You ask me questions. At the end, I pick somebody who had the best question, and I send them beer money through Venmo or PayPal or Zelle. There's so many ways to send money these days. Whoever uses cash or checks is an idiot. I thought you were going to a Vince Shapiro. Like, well, how? Like uh, an ad? Yeah, when he talks about uh, what, the cash out. No. We need to get we need to get a uh, a sponsor for Dream Girl Rich. Yeah, yeah. Dream Girl Rich brought to you by the whiteboard company, where we draw stupid shit on the whiteboard. Actually, uh, the whiteboard I think was a hit last week. The whiteboard is back, and last time we stole the whiteboard from our uh, production facility across the lawn, and uh, it was needed, so we got our own whiteboard. So now, every time I have a thought, I can write it down. Yo, I think take that thing down. Let's get some natural light up in this bitch. Uh -huh. What's going on, everybody? Yeah, I like that. I think it's better. Happy Friday. I just finished a podcast about huh. gaming and esports. What were you going to say? I was <laughs> uh, Gaming and esports and this whole world of making money and gaming. Actually, you know what? I, when do I think like the most interesting thing that I said right off the bat, if I had to summarize one sentence, he said that uh, in the future or coming soon, or I don't know, there will be uh, scholarships for gaming, which I think will open it up to a whole different perspective of parents and uh, like accepting gaming. And he basically, Darren Glover, he works for Gary V's company, uh, Vayner Sports, uh, which has a branch called Vayner Gaming, where they represent gamers. And he was coming on just talking about the whole industry. And I was curious because I wanted to know what the hell's up with this esports thing. I mean, I, I, it's weird to watch people play video games, but what's the industry like? And he explained it to me very well. He explained it well. And uh, you got to listen to the podcast that's coming out. I did three podcasts this week. I had David Meltzer on. Uh, my podcast yesterday was with the Real Business Owners Instagram account. And then today about esports gaming. So the podcasting is rolling. United Monograms is blowing up. It's going great. And now the show, Drake and Grow Rich. So someone, someone, uh, someone asked me a question. Limbo Kim, send a request to be in your live video. Uh, you know what? B9 is too early for that. Yeah, I'm gonna wait, wait, wait a little bit. List something for Sean to draw. All right, Brandon has got a uh, a list of, of things for me to draw. And last week we had some good bits from, um, you asked me to draw about capitalism and like concepts on the board, which is kind of cool. Cause whenever you ask me to draw people, I'm so bad drawing people. Actually remember last week you asked me to draw my ideal physique. Yeah. <laughs> that was my best drawing. I think <laughs> and I just drew like a jacked guy with like short legs and like a long neck. And like, you want to be a draft? But, uh, ask me, that's kind of like what this is. Yeah, we'll wait till I... Ask me anything. I hate how it's uh, reversed, though, but I got to be able to see myself. Oh, the ashtray is back. The ashtray. Now, one thing about Dream Girl Rich, before I read your question, is I've, I've, I've noticed a recency bias where I, f I forget the good questions at the beginning. So stay tuned. 
and ask the question at the end, maybe. But the question from the ashtray, which is, uh, I'm assuming your name's Trey. That's a, it's a funny name, but it's also like the ashtray. It's like kind of derogatory. Was United Monograms and its business model your idea or Shelby's? Also, had it not taken off, would you still be pushing United Tees? Sorry, I went through another damn hurricane last week. Damn. Uh, I started it. I started it. I started it. I started all the business and the business model. It's all me. Shelby was obviously on board with the business model, but she brought the style, the style. And we both kind of discovered monograms together. But I could absolutely not do it without Shelby as the girl. And would I still be doing United Tees? Probably. If it weren't for Shelby, it'd be very, very interesting to see where my business career is at. Because actually, I remember actually like broke up with Shelby for like three days once. It wasn't a real breakup. But it was because I was like, quit my job. And I was like, sorry, my life's about to go crazy. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. It's going to take many years to be successful. And I don't know if you want to be with me for this. And like... For three days, we kind of were like, I, I said that. I was like, you gotta let you gotta let me know if you're on board with this because I am not going the traditional path. I'm going to be a crazy entrepreneur. I'm gonna go through struggles. I'm gonna go through hard times. And I like I gave her like a couple dates, like think about it. And Shelby was like, All right, I'm on board. I'm on board. And she has been such a massive part of building this company up and everything that has been ha has happened has been helped shaped by her and if it weren't for her i still would have been an entrepreneur i still would have been going into business and i still probably would have stuck with united tees but it would look so different so in an alternate universe where uh me and shelby broke up after college i would love to see where i'd be at at this point um but i don't want to take a gamble and take that life because this is going great and it's my wife now so uh, she's been a big part of my career, and she's been amazing. You like cigars, the ashtray. <laughs> All right, you like cigars. I hate cigars, actually. And honestly, I think that anybody who says that they like cigars is lying. They're lying. It's just like anyone who says that they like Guinness beer. Anyone who says that they like Guinness beer is lying through their damn teeth. Because that shit is gross. And cigars are like... <coughs> It's like nobody wants to smoke a cigar. Come on. But what do I know? I'm just a fucking idiot. <laughs> Shelby is the best. Who said that? Murph.a. Nah, that's Murphy. Allie. Murphy. Murph dog. What's up, Murph dog? It's my brother's girlfriend. Anyone who likes Blue Moon is lying is trash. <laughs> Actually, uh, oh, wait. I need my. Just like my plaid button down shirts, my handsome face and my pencil, I feel like blue moons are becoming part of my brand. And I don't know, blue moon, I, my opinion on blue moon is that they just win beer. The only reason you would not get blue moon, and I guess this is my taste buds talking, I can't talk for everybody's taste buds, but blue moon is so delicious and it is uh, well priced and it's drinkable and it is, there's really no reason to drink any other beer. They win beer. And that's my opinion on Blue Moon. They just win. And like, look how cool like their branding is, you know? It's like, also I am an absolute uh, like addict or uh, light blue, anything that's light blue. We were watching, me and Shelby were watching the TV show the other day and there was this girl in a light blue dress. And I was like, oh, that's a nice dress. She's like, you just like the light blue part. I love light blue. And I didn't even mean to be saying that wearing a light blue shirt, but light blue, or like sky blue. Like well, I'm not talking a turquoisey green. I'm not talking a dark navy or a midnight navy. I'm talking a light blue. It's the ultimate color for me. I love it so much. All right, the game's about to begin. And the blue moon has that. Your monogram on your shirt. Your idea or Shelby's? Uh, all right, the game's about to begin, you said, but let me answer the question. Uh, it was my idea. It was my idea because um, I honestly, like I have a bunch of dress shirts and I was like, I grabbed one. I was like, yo, bring this in the back. Just, just put my initials on it just for the hell of it. Because United Monograms blowing up great company, all girls, all girls. Um, now imagine if somehow we could expand our audience by 50% by selling to guys. I was like, I'll be the guy to make monograms cool for guys. Um, but 
I don't know. I just wanted to try it. So this shirt I pulled out of my closet this morning and I was like, oh, it's got that on there. So I'm rocking it. It was my idea. The blue moon's better on tap. Yeah, sure. Put it on the cuff, right? That's kind of the guy way to do it. But this was like, this was kind of more like the traditional uh, monograms the way that we sell for girls. I'm trying to, I was trying to put it as a guy thing, but I don't know. All right, Brandon, what do you got for me? Brandon, the co-star of Drink and Grow Rich. All right. All right. So you got to drink every 10 seconds. Got to drink every 10 seconds. And uh, we're going to make sure that they can see the, see the screen. So this is, I have no, you asked me this morning, I saw that you had a few things written down and you're like, do you want to know what they are? And I said, no, I don't know how to know what they are. So everything Brandon is asking me to draw right now. And we'll see if we keep going with this uh, drawing thing. Um, everything good? Uh, what? Everything good? Yeah, yeah. I got a little icon at the bottom. Let me see what this is. This one. Uh... Oh, coming off the stand. What is this? Uh, that's the person who wanted to go live with me. Sorry, Kimbo Slice or whatever your name is. But uh, it is a way to take Dream Grow Rich. It's not popping up. And put it in a more visual context. All right, so. All right, I don't know what to expect. What do you want me to draw, Brandon? All right, drink first. Drink first, all right. Cheers, everybody. I hope someone out there is having a, is having a drink with me. <sighs> All right. All right, let's do it. Draw the business model of an OnlyFans girl account <laughs> in four images. Um, draw the business model of an OnlyFans girl account in four images. Okay. Um... Are you blank? You gotta drink the whole beer. The business model, okay. I mean, it's a good business model. All right, so. That's one image. Okay. <laughs> and then. This is the second image. That's the girl inside the camera. And then this is the third image. Oh, you gotta explain what you drink. All right, this is a thousand people. This is a thousand people. And the fourth image is this. I don't know, does that work? Is that good? It's uh, one person on their phone who is doing one thing. What is that one thing? I don't know what they do on OnlyFans <laughs> account. I heard, I wonder who I heard had an OnlyFans account, uh, Aaron Carter. Oh, the senior guy. The uh, the not the guy from not the guy from uh, Backstreet Boys, but oh. his little brother who had that one song. It's like that's how I played Shaq. That was actually a cool song by him back in the day. <laughs> but I guess he's probably older now and he's not as famous. And uh, apparently, he like jerks off on there. Oh, okay. Like, I, I was like, <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, I haven't seen it. I just heard about this somewhere. Right. But I don't know. That's the business model, right? It's one person broadcasting to like thousands of people on just their device. And to bring this back to a business sense of Dream Girl Rich, I was talking about with uh, on my podcast with David Meltzer, who I had on my podcast this week, who's a famous guy, about how every time I sell a shirt, it has a cost of goods sold associated with it. And every time I sell one, I got to produce one. But one of the reasons I like want to maybe build up a media agency or starting a podcast is that you just do something one time and it can be consumed a million times after the fact. And there's something special about something that can be done once and sold unlimited times without any extra added expense to the cost of goods sold of the business. So that is like a content model. And uh, that is a good business model. It's just harder to monetize and to execute. But think about that if you're looking to start a business, all you people. All right, take a sip. All right, take a sip. I like that. Sometimes I get rambling and I forget to drink. So good reminder. Because <laughs> the drunker I get, the better this might get. Or worse. I don't know. All right. Draw the person you most like to be or look up to. Draw the person that I most like to be or look up to. And why? In, in, in three images. 
I mean, the most person I most like to be able to look up. Oh, so basically, like, who's my who's my all time favorite person? Like, you got draw and then it's fun. All right, got it. <laughs> it's Jesus. Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth is. I'm not very religious at all, but this motherfucker knows how to make a legacy. Make a legacy last over time. Who's the most famous person of all time? Jesus. 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 Like, I think that this was a guy who lived in zero, right? Okay, the whole, what year is it? 2020. 2020. The world has been around for a lot longer than 2020 years, but this guy started to shape the world. And uh, like, religion elements aside, look at it from just a personal branding element. This guy knows how to personal brand better than anyone I've ever seen. <laughs> Ellie said, that's not what I look like. <laughs> Sorry, Ellie, you're not my favorite person of all time, but uh, I feel like it, to be a hero like that, like it'd be embarrassing if it was like uh, someone that was like the same age as me or someone who's like still going. You just, to be, to look up to, you have to have, it's easier to, it's easier to like, like, suck dick of like a of like a older deader person like walt disney or something someone who's like if gary like what if i had a picture of like gary v behind me that'd be so kind of like corny you know <laughs> all right take a but, sip. all right take a sip but i think jesus was somebody who was politically minded and i don't know all the details of it but he had his name like all right some politicians they get a, a bridge named after them uh, there's this random bridge around me and there's there's a little green street sign that says his name on it. I forget it. it might be like even that Maybank guy or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, that's their legacy. That's my that's a great legacy. They have a bridge named after them for all of time. Like, that's a great accomplishment. This guy, Jesus, you know what kind of way he shaped the world and, and being spread across the across the world and his his messages. The best personal brander of all time is jesus now i don't believe that i walked on water because that's physically impossible and i like that he turned that water into wine baby because that's what he would do for me on drink and grow rich <laughs> all right next one all right what's up sean keep crushing it bro boom business bros what's up <laughs> all right yeah so what was your question that i answered this to uh draw the person you most like to be or look up to dude in 2000 years, if people are still like kind of fighting over me and talking about me and like praying to me, like that would be awesome. And I, and I respect the fuck out of Jesus for the legacy that he left, whether religious or not religious, you got to admit it, that guy left a fucking legacy. All right. Take a sip. All right. How would you win a world war in three images? There's a lot of logistics to that. <laughs> give me, give me some type of scenario. Uh, how would you win? Uh, like, like the battle of the bridge. I don't know. That's your World War One. I. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, if I was, uh, yeah, get creative. If I was, if I was going to win World War Two, I would do what we did because we won. I could, I could describe how we won World War Two. But that might be boring. Um, well, it depends on who's fighting. Why are we fighting? What's the logistics? How would you defeat the Chinese in World War III? Okay, all right. That, that's a better. That's a better setup. All right. So it's World War Three, and it's and it's uh, it's America and their allies versus China and their allies. Ooh. Okay. So the one thing we can't do is. They have, a, they have a billion people. We only have like 300 million people. So they got more people. Um, how do we beat China in World War III? All right. America versus China. World War III. Dude, oh man. We're going to have to... All right. 
I wasn't going to make it easy for you. All right, all right. All right. Here's the world. You see it on there? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Here's the world. This is hard. Is the war China? Well, he says the war on uh, in China or on home soil. Clearly, I'm making up the scenario as we go. You can make up those scenarios. All right, so here's the world. Here's America. Here's America. Here's China. All right, so here's what we do. All right, here's what we do. We nuke Beijing first because that is, that's their center. And then they'll probably nuke Washington. All right, so Washington and Beijing are out. <laughs> oh, then, uh, then we nuke, then we, what's, uh, then we nuke, then we nuke the second biggest city in China. Hong Kong, maybe? Yeah, Hong Kong. And then they nuke LA. So LA's out. Then, then we nuke Wuhan. <laughs> and then they nuke New York City. All right, so we're out, we're out our biggest cities. So what's left? The center of the country. What do we have the center of the country? Guns. Guns and corn. <laughs> so then we set off 200 nukes and we all go to Iowa and hide in a bunker for yeah. a year. They nuke us back, no effects. And then, uh, and then, and then we get out and we're all fucked. And, uh, but we, we think we won because we lost all access to the rest of the world. And then we say, oh shit, why did we nuke Beijing and Hong Kong? And then the whole fucking world's over. So, <laughs> so that's the ending. We, we, no one wins. We yeah. fucking lose. <laughs> yeah, so much. Dude, imagine, imagine, um, like if the fucking Germans got their hands on a nuke, we're so lucky. We are so lucky that we, that, uh, we're so nasty. I don't think that there'll ever be, um, it, it's crazy to think that, uh, ever since World War II, nobody has tried to take over, uh, nobody's tried to take over any other nations. Like no one tries to take another nation by force. And, uh, like that's why Japan did it. Japan did it because they don't have any good natural resources or ports and stuff, and they're too tiny. So they try to take over shit. And now, ever since World War II, everyone's like agreed. All right, no one let's 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 use diplomacy. Let's use cyber warfare. Let's not actually kill each other because no one wants to die. Do you want to die? I don't want to die. So take a sip. But let me use this, let me use this uh, opportunity to say thank you to the troops. Someone said this should be an episode of Drunk History. <laughs> that was not history. And I don't know, that wasn't my best like answer, but there's a lot of, there's a lot. Uh, see, the beauty of World War II is that there wasn't nukes. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of strategy. There was a, uh, you know. D-Day was let's a bunch of people are gonna die, but once we get on the beachhead, then we can start strategizing as we're on Europe. Nukes, nukes and bombs and technology, they ruined the whole concept of the original world wars, which were all about troops and strategy, like I mean, intercepting intelligence. Now it's just all about nukes. So that kind of ruins the whole fun of world wars. Now I'm not saying it's fun. I'm just saying the strategy, the, the military strategy. It's not fun anymore because it's just like, oh, let's nuke the fuck out of you. It's like, oh, it's not All right, fun. Take a sip. All right. Describe your childhood in three images. My childhood in three images? All right. Like ages like zero to 11. Zero to 11? Just let me, let me just have my childhood in, in three images. Okay. All right. Um, I gotta start over. <laughs> the childhood in three images. How the fuck do you draw a pretzel? 
Ah, uh, the twist to shit. That's a pretzel. I, wow, I really cannot draw a pretzel. And then, uh, here's the third image. All right. Take a sip. Take a My childhood in three images. So I kind of have a, I kind of have a, a crazy childhood. Um, like my dad had ALS and passed away when I was twelve, and our families like didn't get along and kind of and, and kind of fought. My mom's family and my dad family. But anyway, I moved a lot. I moved a lot. So after my dad passed away, I moved to. From Syracuse to uh, that pretzel, actually that that <laughs> Molly that helps. Hold on, let me try again on the pretzel. <laughs> it's like it's like that helps a lot. It's like a heart with a mustache. <laughs> it's like a heart with a mustache. <laughs> All right, that's better. All right, but um. Here's, here's, here's where I'm going with this. I moved a lot, all right? So when I was in in sixth grade, I had to move away from all my friends. And it was very sad to move my friends. I moved from Syracuse to uh, outside of Chicago. And on the first day of school, I didn't have any friends. And the, the thing about being a new kid on the first day of school is that um, no one really knows you're new because everyone's just getting used to their new classes and their, and their new environment because it's new for them too so they don't they're not saying who's the new kid if you're the new kid in the middle of the year then they're like okay everything's normal this is a new kid we know he's new no one knew i was new so the first day of school i went to the lunchroom in seventh grade and i got a pretzel i don't know why i got a soft pretzel and i had it on my tray and i walked around the lunchroom looking for somewhere to sit and i had nowhere to sit so i ended up sitting in the bathroom eating the soft pretzel and crying okay it was pretty sad but um, I ended up making friends, right? So I loved it. I lived in Chicago, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, three of the best years of my life. And I loved it there so much. Um, ended up making great friends after the pretzel situation. So then, I, and then because uh, of family situations, I moved again in, in, in 10th grade. So in 10th grade, I moved to uh, Philadelphia area, outside of Philadelphia. And I was the new kid again in 10th grade. And again, I was the new kid on the first day of school. No one really understood that I was new. So they just thought I was a guy that had been there since kindergarten that, that was not that interesting. So they just didn't really care about me. And so the first day of school, I don't know why, I swear, this is why I thought of this. I got a soft pretzel again. I guess a lot of lunchrooms sell soft pretzels. And I got a soft pretzel. I walked around the lunchroom. I walked around the lunchroom. Nowhere to sit. I went to the fucking bathroom, sat on the thing, ate the soft pretzel, and cried. In seventh grade and tenth grade, I sat there and I cried at the lunchroom. And actually, in Chicago, I made friends like that semester, but I actually didn't have a good place to sit at lunch like this whole semester. I, I sat with some losers and I was trying to hide. And then eventually I made friends and it was all good. But those were tough experiences, honestly. I mean, a lot of people have tough experiences in life, a lot harder than that. But just the fact of the social element of seventh grade and 10th grade, those are like prime years of kind of like, you will really like care about like your friends and like your social like status and like you're really like self-conscious and like, so seventh grade and 10th grade, I was the new kid in two different states where I knew nobody. I ate a pretzel, sat by myself, cried. And I gotta say, the reason why the third thing is a happy face is because the, uh, the character that I built from these two moves not only gave me perspective on different areas and different people, it gave me the perspective of understanding that life always changes. Life is going on in so many different places. And just the place that you are is so irrelevant. And you can be placed in the most random place and you need to be able to adapt. You need to be able to adjust. You need to be able to uh, thrive in any environment. And I don't know if I'd be who I was today without those uh, moving as a kid. It was tough. It was challenging. And, uh, you know, it's not like, it's not like I was went off to war, but, um, the, the third image is a smile because those experiences taught me a lot about life, about handling challenging things. And I remember this, when I didn't have any friends this first semester, 
the second semester, I had a group of friends that I, that I like kind of wanted to sit with. And all I thought about was on the first day when lunch starts, I need to go sit right there. I need to go sit with those kids. I don't give a fuck. If anyone stops me, they're going to be confused why I'm sitting with them, but I'm going to go sit with them and nothing's going to stop me. I'm not going another semester of sitting like in a weird spot. I'm going to have a spot at lunch. And uh, I think the lunchroom is like the ultimate uh, jungle for young social uh, middle schoolers and young high schoolers because it's like that. It's like, who are you? Where are you sitting? And I was like, I'm going to sit with the fucking cool kids. And I sat with them and they were all like, this guy or whatever and then like by the second day i was like this is just where we sit because you know how you can sit wherever you want but then eventually like everyone's just in the same spot at lunch like so that was just where i sat and that was the boldest one of those one of the boldest moves of my life was going to sit at the cool kid table right in the damn center and that was like then i was good ever since then and i and i thought about it like weeks in advance i was like when this second semester starts because it's a different lunch schedule i was like when the second semester starts i'm sitting at the fucking cool kids table right in the middle no one's going to stop me. I planned it out. I strategized it like it was a war. I was like, I'm going to follow this guy. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get a quick lunch so I can, cannot like have to be late to the thing. I'm going to sit early, but not but not too early where I set the table. It has to already be settled, but I can't be too late. I planned it out perfectly. Boom. I sat with the cool kids and my life was better ever since then. And uh, the, mo- the point is be bold, be courageous, and understand that you got to be able to adapt into different situations in life. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. All right, I got a hell yeah out of Brandon. That's crazy how that story came from that. That's cool. That was good? Mm Mm-hmm. All right, Brandon approves. Take us up. All right. All right. We'll get a little political. Describe the day after the election in three and This year? Yeah. Like the upcoming election? Yeah. After the results are fine, describe okay. how the America will be, people what, will be. What I like, uh, what I want or what I think. What you think? All I'll say right off the bat is, I really, I have one hope. I, 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 I don't care who wins. I mean, I have a preference, but I really, really want the election to be solved that night. I do not want it to trickle. I don't want it to be solved the next day or the next day or the next day. So, all right. Here's where I'm going to go with this. All right. Take a sip. You've been talking. All right. All right. This is the post office and and all the ballots. And then it's the White House. And then this is the polling booth. And uh, this and we pull, and this is going to be. Okay, so I think that we've talked about on Drink Go Rich before. We've talked about uh, my, my opinions on the post office, how much I love the post office. They're an amazing social entity to the world, uh, and I trust them very much. But I think a lot of people, probably mostly a lot more Democrats are going to vote by mail. And it's going to be weird because my mom voted by mail very recently. She voted for Biden and she said that it was a kind of complicated, like she said it was easy, but it was like three different papers. You had to put an envelope inside an envelope. And she said you had to use, you could only use black pen. And so I think it's obviously like the election is always like 50, 50, which is crazy by the way. Like, so it'll probably be close to a 50, 50 thing. So I think that a lot of people that vote by mail is going to get like, it'll take a while to get there. It's got to process differently. And like some people will get like, uh, by like blue pen, black pen, like that situation. And then I think the people that vote by the polls, it's just going to be like a direct thing. And, um, Oh, I see where you're going with that. You see what I'm saying? Like, I think that 
what's going to be important? Like, all right, in 2000, Al Gore and George Bush, I was just a kid. I remember learning about this in school. They, it was a tie, basically, and it came down to the, the holes not being punched in the state of Florida. And um, Al Gore conceded. He conceded. He said, congratulations to George Bush. It's going to be all about the narrative of, because if, if, there, if, if the polls come and the, in the, the, the media and the, uh, the, like the, all the current systems, they know how to read these. They know how to read the polls. So like, I think of a lot of people that vote by polls and I, for some reason I get the vibe it's going to be more Republicans that vote by the polls. That is going to be direct information. And that's going to like feed in that night into the news. Everyone's going to be watching the news that night and that's going to feed right in. So if there are more people that vote by the polls vote for Trump, then I think that'll seem like he wins that day because right. more people at the polls vote it. And then as these mail things trickle in, like that's why I did this because they're going to trickle in the mail. Like it was four or five days after and it turns out it's like, cause it's 50, 50, right. And it's like elect electoral college or whatever. But I think that, um, the the narrative of the first night is going to pause due to poor connection. Oh, it said pause due to poor connection. We're back. But the narrative of, of the night matters the most. And the polls are going to be the more direct people. And this mailing people is going to be more indirect. So I think that whoever has more people vote for them at the polls will control the narrative very early on on that night of November or whatever, third or whatever. And I think that person will end up winning because that will be the public like assumption that because we're used to the winner being chosen that night. And I think that uh, whoever's supporters vote more in person will will win because they'll control the narrative. And I don't know. I mean, that's my interpretation of it. But also, who cares about the narrative? It actually matters who gets more votes. And like, I just hope it's not a shit show. And I hope that it's not like confusing. It probably will be. But <laughs> take a sip on Yeah, because male people are not to be trusted. They may take your bell and change it or throw it away. My mom sent a picture of what she dropped that bell in the mail. And I was like, You don't know where that went. Hey, and, 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 you, and you're talking to a guy who trusts the mail more than anybody. I love the post office. But like, damn, it's like a little path between that box. And that, like, what if I don't know? What if someone runs into the mailbox? Like, I'm voting in person. Like, I'm voting in person because if you can vote, if you can go to the grocery store, you can vote in person. I just feel like I think voting should be online and it should do a scan of your face. And that's the most number one way to guarantee security and guarantee that it gets locked in and guarantee that more people can do it, which is good. My brother voted this morning, he, he voted by, to, by mail. No, yeah, poll, he went to the poll. What? Was the mass one? Wait, they, there's polls you can vote. North uh, North Charleston Coliseum right now. But like for president? Yeah. Wait, I thought the polls were only open on that day. No, you can vote early. Cause it's it, I don't know, but he said he was doing it. The other thing I don't like about voting early is I don't really care about um. Like, I like I like the politics. I like the entertainment and the fun of it and the storyline and the persuasion and the branding. And I like seeing there be like the end game and then uh, the lead up to it, like the October surprise, the November surprise, like, like Trump said, grab him by the pussy. And that was like terrible for him. But then there was still like 11 days. And then after that, Hillary got like the FBI thing came back up. It's like, I like going down to the wire with the storylines. And like, it's actually very informative and interesting to me that you said your brother voted at the polls today? Yeah. It's like what? Like what? Like what? It's either it's either for Jamie Harrison and other and just South Carolina people, but he said he went to uh, uh, he said president too. I don't know. Like what? He said that like, like are all the people that vote on uh, the uh, voting day like procrastinators? I think it's just made with I don't know. Don't yeah, just look it up. But he said he, uh, he like he literally got dressed and got his mask on. He's like I'm going to go. Like what if new news? new information comes out between now and then like <laughs> i mean true, obviously true. obviously 90 95 percent of people are locked into who they're voting for and well he's he, he's a gay democrat so I'm he's, sure Demo sure. he's a democrat <laughs> so i don't think he's gonna change his mind <laughs> right i mean so 
Right. Most and honestly, most people are going to change their mind. Like, like what? Like so hit him and his boyfriend. I was like, y'all going to watch the debates? And they're like, I don't need to watch. They already made my, up my mind. They already made up their mind. Yeah. I mean, like, like, uh, I mean, I like, I mean, I like Trump. Like, um, I'm not super political, uh, but like, I'm trying to think like something that he could do. I remember the day the grabber by the pussy story came out. I was, if the election was that day, I wouldn't have not have voted for him. I was like, I don't know. I guess I was watching the news and I was like, and I, so like, it's emotional for me. Like, of like, they turned it around so quick. They're like, it's locker talk. Like, locker like, right. Talk. Like you did it, but imagine whoever released that story, they should have done it the day before the election because he, they, they left him time to re control the narrative. And like, I, I voted for him and I would not have voted for him if the election were the same day as that story. So like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I would have been thinking. I, I was, I was pissed then. And, but, Caitlin Sexton, Sexton said pairs of polls are open early. Wow. Check this out. Is that just this, Caitlin, is that just this year? Or is that every year? Well, I think they give time, like just general for like disabled people who can't like go out that day. Absentee voting has always been done by mail. And that's like, if you're out of the state, you're not going to be there. All right, next question. All right. How do you fall in love in three images? I mean, that's kind of a good one. <laughs> like, that's a conceptual. Yeah. How do you fall in love in three images? If you need one more image, you got to drink twice. Okay. Damn. Um... I mean, you can draw something simple and explain it for a longer time. Right, right, right. I, I, I get. Yeah, I know that. I got to think about it. All right. So I don't really believe in like. You don't believe in love. I don't believe in love at first sight. Really, I think that there's a game to the dating element that has to map out well. Like, like I actually like fell in love with Shelly at first sight, but she had a boyfriend. And then she, and then she broke up with the boyfriend. We like hung out, but then there was a, she didn't like me because I liked her too much. So then for like two weeks, I stopped talking to her, stopped liking her. Then she kind of liked me. So there that's is, typical. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, that's kind of where I want to go with this. There is a, there is, there has to be, so it's about timing. All right. So. Okay, that doesn't look right. But that's my first image. And then. Caitlin Sexton says, this is honestly the first year I noticed about the polls. All right, so here's my description of it. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> We're past that one. We're on a love now. <laughs> All right, so Brandon asked me to describe love in three images. I thought it was another pretzel. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, here's my description. One person has to love the person, and then the other person has to kind of, kind of love the person, but miss. There has to be some type of, and then eventually it times up together. There has to be a little bit of a, uh, storyline to the to the timing of it and i don't know i feel like if you asked me this 10 minutes later i might have a better answer or a different answer but it has to work out perfectly with timing and there has to be a little bit of that dating game and uh you can have you can have a uh, lust at first sight um but there has to be a period where you're like i don't know i don't know like I don't know. That's my best description. I feel like I could have a better answer to this, but it starts off by missing and then missing and then staying near each other. But then eventually after the, the, the first good feelings and a miss, and then another good feelings and a miss, then those misses have to line up to love where it's like, all right, we, 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 we know each other enough where like, you're not a super creep. You're not a super weirdo. Like you're not obsessive. Like, uh, like, 
I liked you a little bit and this didn't work out. You liked a little bit, this didn't work out. And now like, it's a point where you trust each other, where now you're like, okay, now we, we love each other. We're equal. And like, we can stop playing this stupid fucking game. That's what a relationship is. A relationship is when two people who like each other decide to stop playing a dumb game. And not a, not a dumb game. It, it looks dumb after you're in love and you look back on it, but it's not dumb. It's actually a feeling out process. And I believe in lust at first sight. Uh, but I think that if, okay, here's a good analogy. I think happiness comes from pursuing something. It comes from the constant happiness uh, or the constant uh, growth and going for it. The reason why um, uh, it's great for a business owner to have success is because of the hard work it took them to get there. There has to be some type of, of wow, I accomplished something by getting this person to like me. There has to be some type of, uh, I couldn't have it. Now I can have it. There has to be that little bit of game where you feel that you reached this point and now you guys felt like that together. And there has to be a timing mesh where boom, love happens. All right. Take us out. All right. All right so people got some questions now. One is, uh, that wasn't my best one. You're going to either choose one. Uh, the ashtray said, draw a typical day in your life, five images. And D. Hecker said, uh, what do door-to-door -door sales teach you about business? <laughs> so you can choose one of them. All right, door-to-door -door sales. I'm going with that one. All right. Me and Hecker used to go door-to-door -door sales, and it was awesome. It was very fun job. We were outside. I remember me and him walking around these nice neighborhoods, like freestyle rap and just hanging out. You drive there together. It's a very fun thing to do with your friends. Um, but I remember my first real job out of college that I quit after three months was a phone call sales job. And the reason I got hired for that job was because I told them in the interview that I used to do door to door sales and they respected the fuck out of that because door to door sales is fucking like awkward. It's awkward and you need to be suave to be able to make that shit work. All right, so here is, here's the picture. All right. Take it. All right. All right, here's one picture. It's gonna be the houses. All right, so this is the, this is the, this is the houses, right? They're going door to door too. And then your car, is parked off screen, way over here, right? So your car, so you're walking. All right, so this house, the driveway. All right, so you're walking into the neighborhood and the first house you go to has no one there, but you walk up and there's a fucking crazy dog running to the door and barking like a fucking maniac. And it is the most awkward sales thing to try to talk to somebody and say, oh, hey, would you like a, a painting estimate? As this dog is going fucking crazy. So that doesn't work out. And then you wanna to go to these next two houses. But here's the awkward part. This person is doing lawn work. So someone out in the lawn is doing lawn work and they can see you coming from a distance. So you don't know if you should walk past them and kind of respect them or if you should talk to them because they're in the lawn or someone being out in their lawn is one of the most awkward parts of doing door-to-door -door sales because they're like, you see them from a mile away and you know that they know that you're coming and they kind of know what you're doing because they can hear you talking to their neighbor. Number one worst thing is a dog attacking you at the front door. And that is absolute truth. It's so awkward and, and they, you try to like pet him and like be cool about it, but the dog is just screaming at you and, and that doesn't work out. They're like, nah, sorry, sorry. And then the next house has someone in the lawn. So let's say we walk past this house because it's too awkward. And then the third house has somebody 
who calls the cops and says, hey, we've heard about people casing the neighborhood and uh, we're going to call the cops and they make you wait for them as they call the cops on you, which happened to me. So it's fucking insane going door to door. And the overall message is kind of very similar to the lunchroom situation where you got to deal with these fucking obstacles. And sometimes you can't see them. Sometimes the obstacles hit you in a second. Sometimes the obstacles are coming from a distance away. And it's awkward to know that an obstacle is coming off in the future. Sometimes the obstacles hit you right away. Sometimes the obstacles you can see from far away. And sometimes the obstacles are things that you would never expect. So with so many different obstacles and so many different, the better word from a sales perspective would be objections. With so many different objections, then you have to be ready to deal with them. You have to be ready to uh, put up with those objections and you have to be ready to have something to sell those people. And you don't know what's about to hit you. When you knock on that fucking door, you don't know who's going to answer. You don't know if it's going to be a family of five people watching a movie. You don't know if it's going to be a dad who's home from work and he's in a very important business call. You don't know if it's going to be a horny, bored house mom. You don't know if it's going to be a babysitter. You don't know if no one's going to be home. You don't know if the guy's going to make you wait while he calls the cops on you. And if you let the fear of each of those unpredictable situations control your attitude to the next door, then you're going to lose. One thing that we noticed when we did door to door sales was that we would be streaky, which means that we would have a, a certain attitude that would get one. And then we would feel confident. We'd be like, yeah, we're actually helping people. We're actually like providing the services that they need. And that confidence can't really be explained, but at the next house, we get one. And like, there's something that is unexplained about how your aura is. And that's the sales lesson. The lesson is always have that aura. Let that aura not come from external circumstances internally from situation to situation to situation. Have your aura, your feelings, your vibe. Sales is a vibe. A person to person sales is a vibe. Don't let that vibe be affected by outside circumstances. Let that vibe live within you forever and you will be the best salesperson that there is. Check us out. <laughs> Job description, walk around a neighborhood and ruin everyone's nice Sunday by offering some shit they don't want. <laughs> Unless they actually needed it, in which case we're the heroes. See, I don't do, I don't do, um, like I, I run a business, I'm the only salesperson essentially. And like we've done over $12 million in sales, but I don't really consider myself a salesperson because B to person to person sales are very different than like e-commerce sales and person to person sales take very specific skills, which was that, which was that rant was more about. All right, this thing is getting dirty. I need to. I need to wet my. I need to wet my whistle here on this. <laughs> you want a crazy question? A crazy question. Ask the audience. Ask the audience. Whatever you're gonna ask me. <laughs> Do you want Brandon to give me a crazy question, or what's the, what's the alternative? Uh, a not crazy know. question. Oh, this is like super random. Super random. Someone give a thumbs up if they want Brandon to give me a super random board question. Probably no one's going to give a thumbs up because this is the stupidest show on Instagram, which I said in the beginning. That should be the tagline for Dream Go Rich. <laughs> Dream Go Rich. Fridays, 3.30, Instagram Live, the stupidest show on the internet. All right, take us up. All right, Ashtray. Ashtray, you're looking like the very, very big favorite for the champion of this one. Ashtray said, thumbs up. All right. Okay. Um... Describe each of your employees and we all took DMT together. Well, I, like I said in that video, they have too many employees. All right. It, it describe each of my employees if we all took DMT together. <laughs> like that means I got to do 17 different things. <laughs> like I have, too, I, I have too many employees now. Pick like, five, but not Shelby or Rachel. Like, so is the point of this to 
mention specific employees. I don't know if that's a good idea. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Right. I'm not talking shit on my amazing employees. But like, if you want to do a company as a whole. Yeah, the company as a whole. Company meeting. All right. The company as a whole, if we took DMT together. Describe what would take place in three images. Okay. <laughs> so Their faces are up for that. And then it's fine. Is I think so. It's fine. Alright. <laughs> no, we're good. Why is McDonald's? Uh. Uh. <laughs> Alright, so all my employees take like psychoactive drugs together. Here's what would happen We'd go to McDonald's. <laughs> that's not, that's actually not that. Here's what would happen they would be, they would be taking the drugs and they'd be thinking, and they would look at their pretty regular lives and they would say, okay, my job is pretty normal. I live a normal life. I, I make an hourly wage. Um, I, I, you know, I work pretty hard. I like what I do. Uh, you know, another opportunity came up that paid a lot more. I would definitely do it. Uh, they'd be thinking regularly like regular humans. And then, they would think about how we were just named one of the fastest growing companies in America. We're number, my company is the 1,000th and 30th fastest growing company in this country. And they would say, I would remind them of that when they're on DMT. And then they would say, oh, Whoa. and then, <laughs> and then they would think about, I'm not necessarily making that much more than I was, than if I was working at McDonald's, but McDonald's has 100,000 employees and my company has like 17 employees. So they would think, holy shit, this company is actually fucking incredible. This company is fucking exploding. One of the fastest growing companies in America and I'm only 1 17th of that country uh, uh, company. I am incredibly valuable. I am an asset that other people don't even understand, especially if I worked at a mega corporation like McDonald's. Then they would go, whoa, this is pretty fucking cool. I love what I'm doing. And then we would definitely fucking go to McDonald's and we would get some cheeseburgers and some fucking McNuggets and we would eat that shit. And then we'd be like, yeah. It's pretty good. All right, that's my answer. Also, they'd probably be like, I hate my boss. <laughs> no, they love me. I'm just kidding. But uh, I don't know. That's how I see it going. I, it's, uh, I, I kind of hope that they think that every day. I don't know how else I'm supposed to answer that. I mean, that's the, that's, that's pretty the, good, right? That's the beauty of it. Man. Do you think, so Brandon, you were at the, uh, the company meeting the other day. Like, yeah, it didn't seem like it's like, you know, just a bunch of people hanging out in the company meeting. Like, I think we had a good vibe going, right? Yeah, I like the yeah. Yeah, we had a good vibe. I, I purposely, every three months, I do a company meeting. And um, most of the times, I kind of have like a PowerPoint. I do a speech, mostly me. Uh, this time, I sat down. And everyone else sat down. And we kind of had more of a conversational type thing. And uh, that's just what I was feeling this meeting for my company. And I think it went pretty well. And uh, uh, go with your vibes. And all right, enough about me. Let's help the people grow rich. How are you doing? Yeah.
did you say earlier 12 million in sales? Yeah, I've done over 12 million in sales in, uh, in, since I started. Definitely. Oh, yeah. All right. Draw your favorite toy as a kid. <laughs> I mean, uh, all right, let me, like, let me think. Like, I mean, it's probably gonna be a very simple one. A Pokeball? No, best. Aw. Give me that ball. This is actually a good representation of my favorite toy as a kid. In my best man speech at my recent wedding, my brother talked about how many times we played one-on-one -on -one as a kid. This is, think about this. We play one-on-one -on -one all the time, but we played to a hundred by one. And there was a ceiling. The biggest problem in the basement was if you shoot too high as we got a little bit older, it would hit the ceiling. All we did was play sports. Like, and I think that's pretty common, but um, like we have exceeded our athletic ability in sports success by how much we just played and just played and like developed skills. And uh, literally this one summer, uh, at that one of the houses we lived in, because I lived in a bunch of houses, like I mentioned, we had a fence. If you hit over the fence, it was a home run. We played every single day of the summer and we kept our stats. And like I had the most home runs in the league out of four people, me, Craig, and my two neighbors. But uh, yeah, we just played sports every second of every single day. And that was pretty much all I did. Did I have any other toys that I like? I like, at one point, I was really into Star Wars and I like Star Wars toys and I like Power Ranger toys. Um, but Ultimately, at a certain age, it was just all about basketball. Like, actually, funny story. Um, I was kind of nerdy when I was like six or seven. I had one nerdy friend named Tim Corey, who was my best friend. We were like butt buddies. And um, what did you say? We, yeah, we like we were we were like we were like loved each other, like pretty pretty like yeah, bro man, like pretty like like we would hang out with our families, and then me and my best friend would like just go out into a car and lock the doors. So we just just talk without everyone else it was weird and he was like turned out to be a little more nerdy but like my mom signed me up to play basketball and i bawled my fucking eyes out i cried i said i don't want to play basketball i don't want to play basketball i cried this is like a famous family story like i cried so much i didn't want to play basketball and then she forced me to play she forced me to play she drugged me in the car went to the game and i it turned out i was good at basketball so like ever since that second like i loved Sports. And that's probably my mom's number one parenting moment would have been would have been forcing me to do that. Would you have ever had long term childhood friends as employees? Great question. Great fucking question. My brother worked for me for three months and it didn't it didn't it didn't uh like didn't didn't work out. Like I feel like there's a certain like level to where it could be amazing, but I would, if I had to answer that question with a yes or a no, I would say no. Wow. What a good question. Um, for all the stupid ass everyone drew in middle school. Damn it. It's, it's wet. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> That's such a good question. That's such a good question. And it's such an interesting question because like, I feel like the more success I have, the more likely that might be. But one of my best friends, Nico, I haven't seen him on here. He usually tunes in. Um, he's one of my best friends, not from childhood, but kind of from childhood, from college. Uh, super smart guy. Uh, he's we had the idea of him uh, coming to like work for me before. And I need somebody like who can be a leader in the company and it could be him. And like, I trust him. Like, that's the thing that you like, if, depending on the person, the thing about a childhood friend is that sometimes they're just a friend because they live next door to you. And like, that's not the person that you want. But if somebody who's truly your friend in like college or somebody who like you truly, truly trust as a friend, why wouldn't that be a great person to work with? Of course it would. But like, I mean, I guess, so if Nico worked for me, I, I guess I'd be his boss, like that's weird, but also that could be good. Like I wouldn't, I think if anyone could handle it well, it would be me. I think I'd have the ability to handle it well. 
because all I care about is the company. I don't care about myself. I don't care about my ego. I care about how successful the company is. And if anyone else shares the same visions as me, then I look right past them. You know, I don't care about the individual person. I care about the company. So if someone else I, I trust and I understand that they also love the company and I, and I believe that in my soul, then I don't look at them. I look right past them to the bigger picture thing. And that is where like, like Shelby, like I tr obviously trust her so much. She helps run the company incredibly. And like, I don't think about like, oh, like what's our relationship? Like, but like, it's a very good question. For a default answer, I would say no. But also if you do say yes to that, then it could be one of the most amazing things ever. Did I do that backwards? I did it backwards. <laughs> Sean. Hey, so if you would have been a Shark Tank, which investor would you rather work with? Dude, Astra, you're gonna be the winner. Um by the way, fuck you, Shark Tank. <laughs> if you follow me on Instagram, which you probably do, go scroll and look at uh, a couple posts ago, I don't know, it was like a month ago or something, I post a lot, but it was our Shark Tank acceptance video. And I thought it was pretty fucking good, honestly. What did you think about it? It was really good. It was pretty fucking good, man. I think you, you just, uh, you make too much money for them. Though. Like, right, like, I've only heard when they, the common question when you go on Shark Tank is, what's your revenue? And... How, it Most of them say a million or less. No, I was going to say, you rarely, barely ever hear a million. Yeah. And um, it was Hitler for sure. Or Hitler for sure. Oh, you saw it. Yeah, you guys saw it. I appreciate you guys. Molly, you're competitive in this too. Um, I think our sales might have been too high or maybe the product was too niche for them. But... If, if you ever go on Shark Tank and then they they hear your pitch and then you say that you have like eighty thousand dollars in sales, all the sharks go, oh, okay, like like <clears throat> they've even given some deals to people who have had like zero in sales, just a few. Like like I think we might be too developed as a company to um, get accepted. And to be honest, to be honest, TBH, TBH here. First of all, I would absolutely want Mark Cuban. But TBH, what percent were you offering or did you get that far? Yeah, it was in the pitch. We said, I forget exactly what we said, but it was it was around like a nine or $10 million valuation. It was, I think it was like a million dollars for 15%, which is fucking about right, man. We got a great company. And also you want to start low in a negotiation. But to be honest, I don't want to give up percentage of my company. I don't. Would I give up five, 10% to Mark Cuban? Sure, but I'll admit the main reason I wanted to get on Shark Tank was because of the exposure for the brand and like my podcast. I would have another level to my credibility as a podcaster, as a personal businessman. And also the brand would have got tons of sales that day. The perfect situation for me would have been to give 1% of my business away and have all the exposure from the ABC and the Shark Tank and the and the reruns. So I don't think that um, we, we, cause they hate that on Shark Tank. They hate when you say, when you just go there to use it as a commercial. And I, I would have probably give up 15% for the right amount. But I admit I was more interested in the exposure than I was interested in the giving up of my business. I don't need your fucking money, Lori or Kevin. Even though Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, one of my favorite guys, because he's brutal. So funny, so funny. I love the guy. Like someone will be up there like dropping those tears like they do on Shark Tank. And he's like, fuck you. Or like, it obviously doesn't say that, but he's just like, he's brutal. He's no brutal. emotion in business. No emotion in business. And I love that shit. Um, but yes, if I, I would pay, I would give up 5% of my business right now just to like have Mark Cuban in my contact list, you know? So... I admit, 
And maybe they sense that. I don't know. I think we were just a little too developed. I don't know. I'm, I'm actually honestly a little surprised we didn't get accepted, to be honest. But what the fuck do I know? Who knows more? ABC executives or me? If you say ABC executives, then fuck you, because the answer is me. <laughs> All right, next question. All right. This, I mean, we're, I, I just noticed it's 440. Damn. All right. Yeah, like, next question. Let's go. All right, one or two left. All right, um, two left. Two two left for all you motherfuckers still tuned in during Grow Rich. All right. Try Dragon's Den in the UK. <laughs> I am a fucking American. All right, all right. let's go. Uh, describe how you picked up girls in middle school. Oh, wow. This is a whole big conversation. <laughs> middle school? I got no girls in middle school. How you tried them? I didn't. I just, I was too self conscious. Didn't have any armpit hair. <laughs> let's talk about later oh dude actually okay high school though 19 when i was 19 i was my first year of college i studied this motherfucker named uh mystery man and it was, was it that red pill shit uh i don't know what that means but it was the art of picking up girls and i read this book it was like the, it wasn't a it's not the art of relationships it's not the art of love it's not that important because love and relationships are very important and this uh, topic that I got interested in for like a period of time, it was just the science of picking up a girl at a bar. And it was, it was, there's two things I'll say from it. All right. There's two things that I learned from it that I still remember to this day that I think are interesting. And it's the art of the pickup. It's the art of the pickup, not the art of love or relationship or anything like that. It was one like this. You know, a stool? No, this is a wall. Oh, uh, gotcha. And then, this is one. He cornered himself. All right, so these are the two things I remember from the art of the pickup. Now, the art of the pickup is not a, it's not like good. It's not like attractive. It's like, it, it like taps into like your worst human emotions. And like it is specifically scientifically driven to pick up the opposite sex, whether it be boy or girls. All right. So the first thing was you're at a, and it's all, it's actually not very COVID friendly because it's all, <laughs> someone's laughing. They said corner them because you can't leave. <laughs> it's actually all about, um, it's all about your perception at this social gathering. If it's a social gathering of like, 20, 40, 50 people, AKA a bar, right? And then the science is all based on our evolutionary brains, which come from a group of a hundred people in, a, in, a, in the middle of nowhere uh, in like 1000 BC. Like the, the, our brains have not evolved as fast as our bodies. So like, all right. So you want to start talking to a girl, right? But then you want to put your back foot up on the wall like this, kind of like, and you want to lean back. So, and here's the, here's the art. The art is that all the other girls, or if you're a girl, a boy, they'll all see you at the bar, but you want to lean back. You want to have your back against the wall, leaning up against the wall like this. And you want your general posture to be like this. So you start, so you don't start like that. You got to start the conversation with a girl, but then, once you start the conversation, you kind of move it a little bit and then you put your back against the wall and your general posture goes back and you make, and then you kind of like lean back like this. So your genitalia goes forward. No, no, it's not about the genitalia. It's not, it's not, it's really not. And then the, uh, the girl who's talking to you or the boy, if you're a girl, talking to like people. has to naturally lean forward. So the point of this is all the other people at the bar, they see, they see the optics of the one person pursuing the other person, even if it's not the case. It's not the case. You lean back and the and you make the other person lean forward a little bit. And they don't know what they don't know what you're doing. They don't, they didn't study the art of the pickup. They don't, so they just are trying to talk to you. So they're like leaning forward a little bit. And in your head, you're thinking about so then to everyone else at the bar or the or the party or the social event, it looks like. This girl, this person, boy or girl, is the one that pursued you, and this makes you look more attractive in a in a in a setting that is uh, 
ultimately related back to 1000 BC. It gives you the physical look of being pursued by others. And when others pursue you, that makes other people wanna pursue you. If one person wants you, that makes someone else wanna want you. So this is the way to make somebody at a bar look like, you use someone to look like they're talking to you to make it look like you're desirable. So everyone, every other scent, every other uh, biological scent that's picked up is that you are a desirable person. So that's a little trick. And then the other thing that you did, that's one of the things I remember from, from studying this art. And again, this is the art of the pickup. It's not necessarily something I'm like proud of that I learned. It's not necessarily like, it's, it's, it's natural biological human instinct. It's tapping into that. And it's understanding how it worked and it's using it to your advantage to basically like get laid or like hook up. Like that's what it is. And that's not, that's not admirable, but it's just a science. I didn't create the science. Neither did the person who, who, who put this together. So you wanna look desirable in front of a crowd and one way to do it is to have someone talk to you and then you lean back, they lean forward and everyone else is desirable. The other thing is, now this is more specific. If you're talking to a, um, a girl that you actually wanna like get with or a boy that you wanna get with, then uh, the, the first thing that you do is you go up to them and you say something off-putting. You eliminate yourself from the thing. You're a hot girl. You're a hot guy. You have people come up to you from the opposite sex all the time, the opposite sex all the time. And they say stuff like, you can tell, like, you can tell if someone wants, if someone like, if you're a hot chick and all the guys are always hitting on you and you're just like, I get it. I could probably hook up with you. I could probably hook up with you. If you're the one guy that comes up and says like, oh, like you look like my sister, which is kind of weird. <laughs> or you say like, is that you that smells like that? You say something rude. And again, this is, this is, this is, this is not me. This is the science of it. You say something off-putting to them. You say something like, you look like my sister or, oh, you smell weird. Oh, that looks weird. You say something rude to them. And all of a sudden, all these guys want this girl and they know that they can get them. But if you say something to them that makes you eliminated, they're like, I have no chance at this guy. Then that brings in the human desire that they want the thing they can't get. So if you want to, if you want to hook up with a girl that you like and everyone likes this girl, then you go up and you say something that eliminates you from the conversation. So she thinks, oh, that guy doesn't want to get with me. And then biologically, the brain for that person, kind of like the love thing earlier with missing, uh, missing the opportunity and then reconnecting the opportunity. Biologically, we want things we can't have. So you go up and you say, you can't have me that will make that girl be like, fuck, I can't. So what was this question? Oh, this is how you picked up girls, basically. This is the art of the pickup. And it's a fascinating science. It's, it's actually called the Vitruvian arts. It is, um, I, dude, I, I got real into this for a year. I watched YouTube videos, I took notes. And uh, like, I guess at the time I was picking up girls, I was single. I was at college, I had a fake ID, I was going to bars, I was going to parties. Um, like, it's what not, they? what? Yeah, yeah, I was trying to hook up. And there's a science to, now the next day the relationship starts, this has nothing to do with that. This is about tapping into people's biological brains at a social setting and how to pick them up. And it's kind of fascinating. I remember being fascinated by the Vitruvian arts and the hardest part is just like anything, when you're at the bar, remembering the tactics. It's just like if you're in a basketball game and they tell you that you have to go off your left foot to your right foot to make a layup. And then like, there's a bunch of defenders you don't think, you just kind of throw it up. It's like, it takes a little bit of practice. Just like any skill that you want to develop, um, the pickup arts are a skill. And uh, they're a skill that I haven't needed in 10 years because I've, been, I've, been, I've had a girlfriend, I've been in love and, and I'm married now. Um, but like, this is a good question because it reminds me of the time when I was single. And then I remember like a year later, I was like trying to hook up with this girl and she liked Lil Wayne. I remember I was talking to her and I was like, I love Lil Wayne. And then like, I remember thinking a week later, I was like, fuck, I forgot to be like, I gotta be rude to her at first, but look up Vitruvian arts. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating science. Shelby says one last thing, draw what you want for dinner. Fuck, that's the hardest question of the day. <laughs> The one thing about like, so me and Shelby will have weeks where we uh, eat at home and I think we're getting a uh, HelloFresh or something next week. 
But um, when we always are leaving from the same place, we're always leaving from the office and we're going to go out to eat. It's like, fuck, because you do that mental drive down this road, mental drive down that road. You already know all the restaurants. Um, all right, Shelly, I'm talking to you. Ooh, Molly's making a great case for her being the winner. I never had pretzels in school. I don't know what kind of school. So, like a big soft pretzel. Never, never been in a cafeteria. Shelby, let's get soft pretzels for dinner. That's the answer. And then you're gonna go to the bathroom and... So I gotta decide who wins. It's either gonna be the ashtray or Molly. Has Molly won before? Molly, no. Molly's the ashtray is never won, right? Molly, uh, the ashtray deserved a win one time and I didn't pick him. And Molly's been on her game this whole thing. And by the way, for anyone, wow, you said I can seed. All right, Molly wins. By the way, like I talked about with the politics things, never concede, never concede. By the way, for anyone watching this, I absolutely fucking respect you and understand that this takes up your whole screen. It takes up your whole screen. We put them on YouTube later, but like I don't watch a lot of lives on Instagram because it takes up my whole fucking screen. I can't text, I can't watch something else. So, damn, I was probably gonna pick Ashtray, but he said I concede. So the winner, is Molly. Molly with your pretzel emojis. And uh, I don't even know what the specific question was, but I appreciate your engagement. I love you guys. We want for dinner. And we're having soft pretzels for dinner. Oh, yeah. And this has been Drink and Grow Rich. <laughs>